showing them that we can provision an environment zero to everything in 15 minutes. So, when I submitted the, the talk title to James in a, in a rush, I said one in 400,000. I'm going to go with one in 379,592. As per my media training with IBM, I can never, I'm not allowed to make statements about employee numbers, so that's from Wikipedia. <laughs> so, um, yes, I work for IBM. When I do talks like this, I enjoy, now because of our design practice, I actually enjoy going to our design pages and sort of stealing some of their graphics because they're quite nice um, and little animated things like this. So I work for IBM. I work for our Emerging Technologies Group, which may or may not be a team of about 40. Um, and so we're not, um, we're not product development. We're not out-and-out -out client services. We sort of sit in between. We do emerging technologies, which can be anything, really. Um, it's basically anything we can find an excuse to do and get someone to pay us to do it. Um, both doing outward-facing proof of concepts and client work, but also internal playing around with stuff. So, can I just uh, quick poll the room? Who has heard of Node-RED? Nah. Okay, so I'll talk to this side of the room. Um, <laughs> so, Node-RED is an open source project we've created. Um, very sort of briefly what it is. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi or in the cloud. Point your web browser at it. It gives you this application editor, you can sort of drag on nodes, start wiring things together and compose an application. So this one is gathering tweets mentioning Star Wars. I think this was the day Star Wars came out um, in December. It's sticking it in the database. It's, I'm adding in a node to do some sentiment analysis. Um, and then another flow down the bottom which sets up an HTTP request. So when I hit that request, it goes and retrieves those tweets and presents them. Um, so. If I had said that a bit slower, I would have been further through the video. So I go and hit deploy, that's now running. I now switch tabs, hit refresh, and there are the five most recent tweets about Star Wars. So it's an application development environment, really easy to use, and it's an open source project. Um, since we've published, it's, it's built on top of Node.js. Since we published it to the NPM package repository, you know, we've seen fairly steady growth. So we're down to about, three or four hundred new installs from NPM a day. Um, we never did work out what happened on October the 17th. Um, we think it may have coincided with when there was a critical vulnerability, so you know, all of AWS and all of Bluemix and everyone was rebooting all their machines to apply a patch, and I think it just caused a storm of reinstalls, but there we go. But you know, we're doing all right. Um, as of December last year, we're now pre-installed on Raspbian, the default image for Raspberry Pi. So if you go and download that, install it, it's there in the menu right up front. Uh, there's a company called Multitech who ship hardware device with Node-RED on it as the environment for configuring the device, for example. Um, there's a company called RedConnect who provide no Node-RED as a service, a cloud service. You can go and sign up, get instances, and start building your apps. There's a small company you may have heard of, AT&T. If you go to flow.att&t.com, Node-RED is a service that they've, they've built out and offering as a service. Um, now, I have to admit, this is the first time I've driven Keynote. I was kind of hoping I'd have the presenter display in front of me so I'd know what slide comes next. <laughs> so there's a good chance some of my punchlines are going to get entirely spoiled <laughs> because I display the slide before I do the joke. Essentially, that... and there we go. That's kind of how I've been feeling for the last three years in terms of how did what started three years ago pretty much to the day to the point where someone like AT&T is offering it as a service where um, companies are shipping products using some code I just started hacking together in my office on a rainy January day three years ago. So um, you know, this talk is kind of well, it's the second time I've done this sort of talk, not pitching what Node-RED is and, and isn't it wonderful, more about the, how the hell did that happen? Um, it's, it's odd. So, winding back the clock a few years, um, probably 2008, 
2009. I was working in a small product development team before I joined Imagine Technologies, working on the snappily entitled IBM Lotus Expediter Microbroker. Um, <laughs> So what this was, was a very small, lightweight messaging engine, very tiny. The goal was it could run on a mobile phone, and it's about messaging. So publish, subscribe, a little engine, you can publish the message to a topic, anyone who's subscribed to that will get those messages. Really easy. But the goal for us, being microbroker and not the big enterprise stuff, was meant to be really easy to use. It was meant to be just install it, run it, and it just works. And on the whole, it did. Now, one of the things that proved really useful to be able to do would be, well, when a message arrives on this topic, I actually need to change it slightly, or I want to reroute it somewhere else and then pass it on. And Microbroker had um, a programmatic API for doing that. But all too often, we had this user story come in. Yes, it had a programmatic API, but, oh man, was it not user-friendly. It was a real pain. And just saying, all I want is when something comes in in centigrade, translate it to Fahrenheit, or if you're being civilized the other way around, um, <laughs> then you had to write so much code. And it was Java and, oh, and OSGI. And so... As a side project, because I, I was the lead developer on this team and you know, getting this feedback, I started thinking, well, there must be an easier way to do that. What if we could have some sort of graphical tool to express that idea of wiring things together? So as a side project back then, I started playing around with what can I do in the web browser? So this is late 2008. Um, you know, all the browsers are entirely compatible. You know, there's standards across them all. <laughs> they're, they're really powerful, what you can do with them. Um, and I started playing around, and as with often, you know, when you have a problem you want to solve, of course you end up um, yak shaving, getting completely distracted. So rather than build something that mapped, I could graphically map one topic to another, I built this logic gate simulator, um, and you know, stuck it up on um, the website, which those with good eyesight can see, it's still there. It still just about works. Um, and that was kind of significant at the time. It was, I'd had this idea, I'd got to the point where actually I had something I wouldn't mind putting up online for people to play with, but the energy getting even just this, you know, this landing page you can see in front of you, which tells you a bit about it. By the time I'd done that, I thought, well, that's sort of done that, now I get on with the day job, and I kind of forgot about the how do I work, you know, actually solve the problem I was trying to solve with how do I represent mapping messages between topics. Oh, let's play that again. So fast forward to the beginning of 2013, and um, I was just playing around. I was in a bit of downtime between billable client projects. Um, the nature of our work is we're encouraged just to start playing with technology when we have quiet time because you know, we exist on our ability to play with new stuff. And I'd already done a bunch of projects using D3, which is a JavaScript toolkit that makes um, you know, it possible to create really quite attractive visualizations. I won't say it makes it easy. Um, those of you played with D3, it's real sort of mind shift. But once you get it, once you understand it, it's actually really powerful. One of the examples on their site was this, of you can very easily just draw, draw these, you know, drag boxes. And there was just something about that day that suddenly sparked, reminded me of that previous project. Um, so I started playing around, um, seeing what I could do. And um, yeah, after a couple of days hacking around, I got a really bare bones prototype, which sadly I can't find the code for anymore. But I showed it to a colleague and said, look, in the browser, I can draw these two, two, drag these two boxes on, draw a wire between them. I can type into this box, topic A, this one, topic B, and doesn't that look good? And he said, well, that's great. I said, well, it wouldn't take much to make it actually work when I hit that button, actually do something in the back end. He said, well, go on then. So a couple of hours later, with some Node.js in the back end, it was. It was working. And I guess something happened because it really struck a chord with the sorts of problems we were having to deal with. Of We as engineers are more than capable of writing that code to wire together two topics. But when you start thinking about other sources, maybe it's a serial port. Because again, a lot of the projects we were doing were physical sensors and Raspberry Pis and getting data from devices. We can write that code 
but the time we spend writing that code is not time actually creating something useful. So I added in a serial port node and a couple of others. And about three months later, I found myself on a, um, at a client site where I got to don the hairnet. And we were strapping Raspberry Pis to a produc uh, food production line with a whole bunch of sensors using Node-RED on each of those Raspberry Pis to orchestrate gathering all the data. So already three months in, we as a team were using it and finding it useful. Um, you know, which is good, and often with projects like that, that's kind of as far as it goes. It just becomes a tool you as a team use. But we, you know, we were keen to go further, and we thought there is more to this. Um, you know, members of the IoT London community, we knew there would be people who would like to be able to do the sorts of things we're doing, you know, kindred spirits. So our goal was very much, let's get this open sourced. As, as we're not a product team, you, we haven't got the heft to just magically make this an IBM product. Open source is the way to do it. Now, being IBM, there, there are processes. So let me introduce you to the automated workflow system for open source management that, without irony, is awesome. <laughs> so this is the process you go through to get something open source with an IBM. Round one, legal. First, you get legal approval. And legal approval means scanning all your code to make sure nothing has crept in there. And we have tools that look for code that say things like copied from or um, copyright O'Reilly or, you know, little indicators that there might be code in there that shouldn't be in there. Um, and then also being Node.js, depending on open source code ourselves, making sure you haven't accidentally included anything that's GPL or, you know, all that good. It's basically a bunch of paperwork, some stuff to do and walking lawyers through technology that, you know, they may not understand the technology side, they're focused on the law. Once you get through that, that's good. Round two, the business. And this is basically getting people with a stake in, you know, is this good for the IBM business to open source to sign it off? And um, this is where we benefit in the emerging tech group that as far as we had to go at this level was our director who, you know, sits a few doors down, has, you know, knows all about Node-RED and that's great. Um, so that was a fairly, fairly straightforward. Round three, the vice president. So it's one thing to want to contribute to an existing open source project. I could have done that at round two. But here we're saying we want to establish a new open source project that is going to have IBM's name behind it. Um, you know, it's potentially visible. So you've got to go that bit further. So you get the vice president on side. Now, I'm sure James will tell you, there are plenty of good vice presidents in the company, as with any company, and of course there are some not so good. When I say good, I mean amenable to this sort of, doing this sort of thing. They, they are all superb individuals. Seriously, you know, with, with this talk, with this talk, I've been working out how far am I opening the kimono in terms of internal process, knowing there are lines like, can't go past, but, um, so I'm treading a line. But Rod Smith, James, no Rod Smith, he is a very good guy, um, and he was absolutely supportive. So that was just a tick in a box. Then you have, and this is probably the one you don't expect, this is the phone call with the board of technical leaders of IBM who have to sign off this as, as the final round. So these are people who won't know anything about what you're doing or anything about it, you submit your paperwork, you attend a call, and um, you defend why you want to do it, and they can ask you pretty much anything. Now, going into this process, I didn't know this call happens once a quarter. So I was kind of expecting we might have a couple of months wait, because of course the internal wiki that tells you when the calls are redirects you to another wiki, then to another wiki, because those ones are deprecated, and I couldn't find the schedule. Anyway, it turned out on the day we submitted the paperwork, the next call was in two days' time, and we had a slot. So we got on the call. We were second on the agenda. Fascinating listening to the first people on the call. They were asking to use some GPL code in a product. And yeah, that in terms of getting a flavor for the sort of interrogating you're going to get, asking IBM people, can we use GPL code in an IBM product, is a sure way to see <laughs> quite a grilling. So I kind of felt, well, 
I think what we're asking is probably a bit easier than that. So, and sure enough, we had some valid questions around, you know, very uh, endemic of the um, IBM software portfolio at the time. Depending who you showed in IBM, Node-RED, they'd say, oh, that's kind of like product X. Or maybe it was product Y or product Z. I think there were about four or five products, depending who you asked. They said, oh, that's just like that product there, which is a sign of the state of the IBM software portfolio a few years ago. And one of the great things that Phil Gilbert's helped do is let's just rationalize down and stop having so much duplication. But, um, you know, that was a genuine question. We have products that at a glance look like you wire things together and you hit deploy, and we make real money off that. Why would open sourcing Node-RED? And we kind of say, well, it's hobbyist. You know, don't worry, Node-RED is it's just a small, it's going to be, no one will notice, but <laughs> it will just be there. They said yes. Now, you know, I said, well, and, and they said yes, so that, that's the end of the process. Um, you know, I said we thought this call was every three months, so we were expecting some downtime at this point before we could do anything. But they said yes, like two days after we hit the paperwork, at which point it was like, well, we can create the GitHub organization now, we can put the code up. Problem is, though, when you think you've got three months to get your code into a good shape before you prepared for it to go public, and then you suddenly find, well, we could do it today, I refactored the entire thing in two days just to get rid of the cruft, to get bit, you know, that sort of personal pride in the code because um, I didn't even want the initial commit on September the 5th. Um, you know, I didn't want that initial commit to have anything in there, any of those dirty secrets in the code that I knew were just ugly code. So it went up on GitHub and it just started gathering pace from there. We presented at IoT London Meetup to our friends in the community. Two weeks later, there was the Wuthering Bytes um, techno hard, oh yeah, um, hard, uh, open source hardware user group meetup up in Hebden Bridge. Two weeks later, one of our sort of friends in the community was doing a workshop there about using MQTT for home automation. I went along to speak to um, talk about Node-RED. He was doing a workshop on Node-RED. I was like, okay, fine. And, <laughs> And that was weird. Two weeks after we'd open sourced it, I went to this event and looked across the room to a room full of people I don't know, and they all had it on their screens using it. And it just sort of snowballed from there. And since then, um, you know, every week, every month, we see people on Twitter using it, and, and it's odd. It is genuinely odd to see it snowball like that. Um, when you look at up on GitHub, um, you know, this is, there are multiple repositories. I mean, this is the very core of Node-RED, and you can see sort of the ebb and flow of development over time. Um, we've got a whole, you know, I'd say we've got about 30 or 40 people who have signed the paperwork that IBM forces you to have with an open source project if you want them to be able to contribute. Um, and, you know, people make small contributions, large contributions, whatever it is, it's all good. Um, so let's take a punt on where my slides go next. So this was, this is where we, okay, context. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of no dread, kind of what the process we had to go through to get it out. And what I wanted to try and distill down, rather than just tell you the life story of no dread, is what are the, um, well essentially, what are the cliches we've learned that you've all heard, but I'll, I'll reel out. And the first one was this guy, um, Voltaire. I always go blank on his name, Voltaire. Uh, I did this slide, I tweeted that I was going to drop it because it didn't, well, basically because none of my other slides quite lived up to this one, but I've, I thought I should leave it in having worked out how to do animation in Keynote. Um, Voltaire, and the other reason is Voltaire said it in Italian, this, what I'm going to tell you, in Italian, and after a couple goes at saying it, I decided, no, if, if I don't reference Voltaire, I don't have to try saying, perfect is the enemy of good in Italian, which I'm not going to do. Um, perfect is the enemy of good. We got approval to open source, the code was ready, it was working. I held off open sourcing it for a few days because I wasn't happy with the state of the code. Not because it didn't work, not because it wasn't functional, I wasn't happy. Perfect is the enemy of good basically means, well, if you're always striving for perfection, you lose sight of the fact of, actually, this is good enough, this is going to work. You can always improve it, but um, you, know, you lose sight of what you're trying to do. 
which is the next one. You don't need permission. I mean, I say, these, these are trite cliches, but they're so true. Um, no one said to me, Nick, we need a tool that can do this. Please go and spend some time doing this. It was, you know, this was a, um, uh, an itch I wanted... I, itch I wanted to scratch or a scratch I wanted to itch. They kind of both make sense. And I never know which way around it should be. It was one of those. It was you know, a, a pet project that I came back to from time to time. And you know, again, no one asked me to solve that problem. It just seemed appropriate to just go and do it. And of course, you, don't need to, you shouldn't need to seek forgiveness for learning. You know, if you try solving that problem and it doesn't prove successful, you've learned something. You learn from the failures. It's like failing fast. Again. I almost apologise for the triteness of some of these clichés. Um, and it doesn't take a committee to get things done. Node-RED, essentially, it's, there's two of us, myself and my colleague Dave C.J. We've done 99% of the development of Node-RED. We're the ones driving this. You know, there's not a huge committee. It's, people, it's funny when I see people say how Node-RED is IBM's big open source project. And I'm thinking, well... I work for IBM, and yes, it's done in IBM's name, but yeah, this is, Dave, my side project. And there's not some big strategic committee d deciding what we do with Node-RED. It, it is an open source project, and it is a community. Understanding the people in the process. How do you, when you live in the, um, I came up with this phrase for this that someone said I should definitely use, and I was on the, um, on the edge, so I'm going to try it out. On the... Um, potentially oppressive regime of working in an enterprise, um, there are processes for everything. And there are people with different agendas. And when you want to get things done, you have to be able to navigate that. And the only way you can navigate that, navigate that is understand the people you're dealing with. In the, in the awesome process, a part of me dies whenever we have to call it that, but in the awesome process, um, <laughs> knowing who we have to get approval at at each level What's their agenda? What do we need to get them to do? Um, what do we need to tell them? What information are they looking for? You've got to give them a reason to say yes, not a reason to start asking questions and finding fault. So giving people a reason to say yes. Make it easy for someone to say yes when you want to do something. Obligatory XKCD, sudo make me a sandwich. Um, and then that's the people, and then recognising what type of process you're faced with. Um, this is something that Dr. Dave, the uh, then director of ETS, told me. He, he sees there essentially being three types of process you're dealt with in, in, in everyday life. So you've got the gas process. These are the processes that just permeate the air. You live with them. You can't avoid them. They're just there. You deal with them. Um, you might not think of them as processes, but you just get by. They don't really get in your way. You have liquid processes. These are the processes which, you know, you end up going to, you're going to get your feet wet, but they're more malleable. You can shape them more to your benefit. If you understand them, you can... Um, they're the ones you can sometimes find the shortcuts. How do you, you know, get through the process quicker? All that good stuff. And then you have solid processes. Now, can you tell, this is the first time I've really used keynote animations. And <laughs> just cheerily, um, you know... <laughs> Liquid one I wasn't so happy with, but that one. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's so gratuitous, but if there was ever a better time to use that. Anyway, a solid process, which can be a brick wall. That you're going at a certain pace, and suddenly you'll hit a process you didn't know about, and you're dead in your tracks, and you can go no further. Um, processes you can't avoid. I mean, everyday life. For those in the UK who have to do self-assessments, Sunday's the deadline. Um, you know, these are processes you can't avoid. But turning that on its head slightly, they are solid processes you can't avoid. But that means they are processes that, if you understand it, there's no reason you can't just power your way through. You get better traction on a solid process because there are steps to follow. And there's no excuse for just not knowing what those steps are and working out how best to work through it. Um, so that's where the original talk ended, about you know, the, the, sort of some of those trite observations we made. But then, um, yeah, I, I had a couple other thoughts that sort of came to me in the last couple of days. I, this is sort of the other side of it, of, yes, it's, you know, I'm still <laughs> amazed about where Node-RED has got to. 
that you know, it has escalated quickly and it's still my little side project, but wow, a lot of people are taking it very seriously. When it's a side project, it's fun, it's interesting, it's good to do. The problem is when it becomes a job, it risks becoming a chore. That there's something about having a side project as a distraction from the everyday, that once it's what you're spending every day doing, then it does take some of the shine off. Um, I'm in a fortunate position that, yes, I, I've been funded to work on Node-RED full-time the last year. Part of that, though, we had a requirement come in from an IBM team who wanted to make use of it, was um, they needed, on the day they ship, to have the UI translated into 10 languages. And, of course, on day one of starting Node-RED, number one requirement, I'm going to start from day one, I'm going to make sure <laughs> you can use this in language X, Y, or Z. So I had to spend two months building in natural language support in both the runtime and the editor and all that entails. And that's not fun. It, you know, it's important, it's um, entirely necessary, but that isn't... A, if you choose that as your interesting side project, then, you know, all credit to you, but it, it's not my thought of fun. If you look at the commit graphs, I mean, you can see the peaks and troughs over, over the time. Um, one observation I make before I sort of wrap up, uh, well, go to the, the next one to make is, it is really interesting once you start getting a community of people involved with a project like this, you start having to deal with all sorts of, of folk. You've got um, the like-minded people, the people in the IoT London community who understand what you're doing, what it's about, and the expectations. But as we've grown, we get, you know, we get questions from... Um, we know there are courses being taught in India using Node-RED, so we'll get storms of questions from an entire class of people in India asking the same question, asking us to do their homework. <laughs> you know, every question they ask is a valid question, and you know, Dave and I, as sort of the core representatives of the project, always deal with each one with proper due respect, and despite what we might be thinking about the sorts of questions we get, we treat everyone with respect. Equally, I love the fact that one of the guys in the community, Mark, says what he thinks. So we had a question, could we use Node-RED to manage a million messages a second? His reply said exactly what we were thinking, but Dave and I were too diplomatic to say. He said, well, you could cross the Atlantic in a bathtub. It doesn't mean you should. <laughs> um, so it's great having a community who, who you know, help support and build the community. But it is also a true reflection, if you look at those graphs, most of the work in the core of Node-RED is me. And when you look at the distribution that gives you times of day that commits happen, um, you can see a lot of stuff during the working day. You can see it goes quieter when I've gone home, I'm having dinner, I'm putting the kids to bed. And then there's a bunch of stuff late into the evening. Quite what I was doing at 3 a.m. on that one Monday, I don't know, but maybe I was in the U.S., but... Um, again, it's when a side project becomes a job, becomes a chore, and you're already working in a mode when you're spending evenings and weekends on it, when it's a side project, it becomes a job, it becomes a chore, you're spending your working day, evenings and weekends. There's a real risk, and this is probably one of the things I struggle with the most, of burning out, of spending too much time on it, that, and uh, losing the enjoyment of doing your side project. Um, and there have certainly been times when I've just not touched Node-RED for two or three weeks. I've done other work, and I'm fortunate in a position that um, you know, I can do that. But it's a real risk. And I think just that message of watching out for when a side project becomes a job, becomes a chore, and burning out is a, can be a real problem. But that's Node-RED. Thank you. Thank you.